Well, welcome back to Bookish, everybody. We're your virtual program on authors, thinkers, and the literary life brought to you by the Southern California News Group and the Bay Area News Group. I'm Sam Dunn, the senior editor of Premium Content here. As always, I need to say a big thank you to our Reader Rewards subscribers for supporting our programs. And if you are a Reader Rewards subscriber attending tonight, you, of, co of course, are automatically entered to win a $50 gift certificate from our partner, Once Upon a Time Bookstore in Montrose. Gotta love those independent bookstores. And hey, speaking of uh, winning a certificate, congratulations to our winner from last month, Lucinda Zurich. Hope you're enjoying those books, Lucinda, and hope you're here tonight. Hey, if you're not a subscriber yet, why aren't you a subscriber yet? Go to scng.com forward slash subscribe. There, there you can find your local paper, sign up, and then you'll know all about the great things we've got going on and support local journalism. Very important. Also, if you've missed our past programs from the virtual side, go to scng.com forward slash virtual programs and check them out. Also, speaking of checking out, check out our cool bookish swag for the stylish book nerds. Yes, very, very stylish. Before we get started, a few things to remind you of. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. And if you just want to add a comment, use the chat feature found on your screen as well. And don't worry, you're not going to miss anything because a link to the program is going to be sent to you later. The show is also posted at the above mentioned scng.com forward slash virtual events. And that's where you're going to find all of our past virtual shows. And that's where you can see what's coming up too. Now let's welcome our beloved hostess, author, performer, playwright, person extraordinaire, Sandra Singlow, my dear friend, beaming in from New York, where she's busy with productions of her play, Mad Women of the West. Sandra, how are you? Hello, I'm well and beaming to you uh, three hours later uh, from you. So it's eight o'clock. It's a very sophisticated time here in New York. So I'm excited that today um, we're doing kind of a, let's see, New York-y, cocktails-y, kind of literary life-y uh, show. Uh, Algonquin and... round table -ish conversation. Exactly. Exactly like that. And and so, you know, although we're mostly a California based show, Southern California, like we do enjoy like going on, but we get bi coastal sometimes and I'm coming from, from New York. So um, today's show is an interesting, it's very, um, Alexandra Jacobs is our first guest. And she is a New York Times book writer. There are other papers that we are uh, friends to also. And then we're going to be talking about Cocktails with George and Martha, which is a very, uh, it's not, it's a New York Hollywood book about the making of the movie of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf with Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. And right. that's a pre -tape. So we're talking about the biography, story, culture, essay, life, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and there you have it. Well, there so, you go. I'll let you get to it. Have a great if show. If you're ready to listen, let's let's go and do it. That's it. Sounds good. Bye. There we go. All right. So first up, we have the wonderful Alexandra Jacobs and the 30 second download, although it'll be somewhat 30 second ish. Um, Alexandra Jacobs is written for the New Yorker, the New York Observer, Entertainment Weekly, and more. Um, Currently, she's a book critic for the New York Times. Uh, and if you look at her bio in the New York Times, she reviews all kinds of books, is often drawn to life writing. We'll come back from there. Um, she is, a, although much younger than me, um, she has an interesting um, history of like being a journalist for a long time, including, and we're going to come back to that um, after graduating from Harvard College, she came back, she came to New York and started writing for magazines in what she calls the golden age of magazines. And we're gonna ask her about that in a moment. Uh, so please welcome to the show, Alexandra Jacobs. Hi. Hello from Brooklyn. Hello, I hear your Hello. voice. Please pardon me. Hello. Is, oh, and there you are. Here I am. Please pardon the uh, very unbookish exercise bicycle in in my background. <laughs> but that's so so Brooklyn. There's it's no books, pandemic. There's stuff it, that, it, it, it's like you'd think uh, we would learn from the '80s not to buy yeah, exercise bicycles, but we didn't learn. Yeah. And so there one is, as there is one in my childhood. There's, 
It's you fantastic. Know. So there's a lot to talk about, but I do as a long time, and I don't, almost don't even talk about my magazine writing past in LA. We used to have like Buzz magazine or whatever, but if I could like the golden age of magazine writing, the before we go to talking about biography, what, what do you mean by that? Gold, and well, some of the younger people don't even know. I know. Well, it's funny. Um, you'd think that we Gen Xers might have realized what was coming in the internet. But, you know, if you, if you graduated from college, as I did in the mid 90s, you might have still thought, oh, like magazines are a very vital and central part of American, even global culture. And this is going to be a thriving career for me. Um, you know, it just was a time when it, still magazines seemed very glamorous, very exciting, very important. And um, I would say the internet or, you know, what was then known, I remember when I worked at Entertainment Weekly, it was called multimedia. And and it had, Entertainment Weekly used to color, which was children, it was a, ma a weekly magazine that covered entertainment and each section of criticism was color coded uh, and movies was most important. And then you'd have like TV, video was separate from movies and TV and, and books, where, which is where I worked. And then there was something called multimedia and it was gray. The color coding was gray, which lets you know what, um, what was, you know, how little uh, the internet was then perceived as a threat to the thriving culture of magazines. It was the I great section. I remember vividly those days. Forgive me, Sandra is, is having some technical difficulties. Yeah. She dropped off. It's uh, like, it's almost like the internet is taking its revenge on Sandra. It is because you yeah, invoke Wi Fi is, you know, the Wi Fi doesn't like what I'm saying. Oh, uh, <laughs> here she is again. Hopefully. Yes. Yes. I'm I'll, back. I'll beam out. We were, we were saying that the Wi Fi was taking a sort of vengeance. Uh, uh, for what I was, you know, how I was reminding it of its gray past. <laughs> right, of the golden age of magazines yeah, when yeah, there yeah. wasn't an internet. And yeah, it, exactly. Just, like, you know, it was something your weird boyfriend did in the basement of the library or something, <laughs> you know, like he had, remember dial up? Remember the long wait for yeah. dial up? Yeah, anyway, so yes. I came of age then. And so I've always been. Um, even before, I, I've always been interested in magazines. Now I'm interested in a more sort of historical way. Um, but, but you know, just, it, they're, they are an amazing um, artifact of American culture. You know, what more can I, y y they're all there in the library, like for us to draw from. And of course they still exist in, in skeleton fashion. So, you know, they're, they're still there for us. Um, I'm I'm wondering, uh, Alexandra, given the topic of your recent book, how how did this did the celebrity did the uh, introduction to celebrity culture come from your work in magazines? Um, you know, I I remember I majored in literature, and I was I was always interested in the idea of celebrity because it seemed like a relatively recent idea, which it actually isn't. I mean, I just reviewed a book about a biography of Margaret Cavendish. You know, and she was like this nutty 17th century, you know, um, real revolutionary. I mean, philosopher and all these other things. And gee, I better fact check. Did I say 17th century? Was it 17th? I always get confused. Um, anyway, she was back back then. Um, and she was a celebrity of her time. So, you know, I, I've always been attracted, interested in that idea of people who want to be larger than life you know, even before there was the media to help them do that. Um, so, you know, I wasn't, I, I had actually, I was probably attracted to Elaine Stritch more because she was an oddity than a sort of straightforward celebrity. I felt her her celebrity was very boutique and very niche. I was going to say, she, yeah. she's a face that you recognize, forgive me, I don't have any notes in front of me, Sandra has all the notes, but I, when I saw the book, I thought that that's a, a face that I've seen so many times before, but know absolutely nothing about, really. I mean, look, either you're an Elaine Stritch obsessive, or maybe you, you saw her on third rock once or you right. know, a lot of a lot of people I spoke to when I was writing the book can have thought I was doing a book about Elaine May um which would be a great book that someone should do probably not me but I'll let you I'll let you get to it Sandra okay 
I'm going to ask these questions quickly because we're being hexed. Um, okay, going forth, Alexandra, you've written book reviews about really big biographies, I'll, Barbara Streisand, Madonna, Martha Graham. So before I get caught off the interweb again, Barbara Streisand's was weirdly embargoed. People don't understand that yes. you have to read a book in 24 yes. hours. Then you'll go to the Madonna bio in case my, like, and yes. what that's like, and then writing a review of Martha Graham's bio. Start there and I'll listen Fine. to people. Like I, will go. I will just go. So go, go. Barbara Streisand was my most exciting assignment of the last year, partly because it was my first time in, uh, you know, for 50, almost 15 years of the New York Times um, of being on the front page uh, on A1, which was very exciting. Um, but because of Barbara, not because of me. Um, and that was, that's a very long book. Um, I want, I, now I can't remember exactly how long it was, but I think it was 976 pages and yeah, your opening I, I blocked was it. Hello Enormous. That, that was my lead. Hello Enormous. I blocked how long it was because I did have to review the book very quickly. Um, I mean, in other words, the book reviewers were not allowed to get the, normally reviewers get advanced copies of a book um, months in or in advance or maybe weeks. In the case of Barbara Streisand, um, a book that is full of news or that everyone's going to want to know what the revelations are, um, they they don't they're controlling the release of it because they don't want the the most exciting revelations to come out and people to just read them and not buy the book, you know, whatever. So I had it, I had sort of pages, um, you know, what I, it took, a, I had to read it in a weekend and, and, and write the review very quickly, um, which was exciting. And, and, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't difficult. It wasn't, I mean, it was difficult in a way, uh, but it, it wasn't, it's, it's a book that's written very conversationally and, um, you know, full of detail, but it, it wasn't difficult to digest. So right. that was that was a, a wonderful and you know I'm I I like Barbara Streisand as I've said in a couple interviews I mean I felt like I grew up with Barbara Streisand sort of like wallpaper in my you know this beautiful Rococo wallpaper in my life um, but I wasn't a diehard Barbara Stan so um, it was interesting to kind of just go through and realized how much she's accomplished and and sort of like the various times she's been underestimated or un under rewarded let's say for directing yentl or you know a a any any number of things that was uh she's she's absolutely like no one else and and it was a pleasure um and then yeah the madonna biography almost as long by a, a tremendously gifted writer Mary Gabriel who has written about the New York City art scene among other things and you know in that case I felt like oh I mean I feel like Madonna like Barbara as she got fame everyone gets weird when they get very famous but Barbara seems to have retained some kind of core of Barbara-ness or relatability or I don't know but like with Madonna I felt like that was a probably a much a very challenging subject um, because it, it it almost felt to me that as Madonna got stratospherically famous, she almost she just became remote, you know, which is very hard for. I mean, Elaine Stritch was the opposite of remote. El Elaine Stritch um, was you know being interviewed like right up into the end and always giving of herself and always. Um, saying stuff and and now you know a, a, mo many famous people now want to control their own narrative and they and they communicate on Instagram or whatever so some if if you're unfortunate enough to be <laughs> writing about someone stratospherically famous perhaps you're drawing from their their social media to fill out their your, Instagram yeah and right. that's or their vegan, their nobody vegan wants recipes. that right. right I mean we can all do yeah. that we're all you know people you're like not all of us but the less those of us with less self control are there at night, like scrolling and looking, and it's not, it's not, it's not that um, fruitful. Um, and then uh, Martha Graham was interesting. Another very esteemed biographer, Deborah Jowett. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. A, a longtime dance critic and a, just a wonderful writer. Martha Graham is someone who's been much more. Um, I'm well, Madonna has been very dissected and written about, but Mar Martha Graham. I mean. I think the first bi biography of Martha Graham was by Agnes DeMille. 
So you're really, that's, um, that's a tough, I think that's a very tough assignment to write about. Um, and, and there was a, there was a Martha Graham biography, I think just a couple of years ago. Um, so that was, so, well, no, go ahead. No, you. Well, I, I was Graham, wondering Martha Graham. In, in that case and what, what we're learning about in biography, also given that uh, celebrities can construct their like through Instagram or through their corporate sponsorships or whatever. It's so interesting that you're saying Elaine Stritch was herself. And is that partly why you were drawn to her? Of I like would, You know what? I w Elaine was almost entirely pre-internet, you know? So there was this, I was drawn to Elaine. I mean, partly cause I'm, I'm, I'm a complete Sondheim, Stephen Sondheim obsessive. And so I think what drew me to Elaine most was, I was intrigued by her role in company of this landmark Sond Sondheim musical. And I just wanted to sort of figure out, I, I sort of, I, I, I knew about Elaine Stritch at Liberty and I hadn't quite put together that she was in the DA Pennebaker documentary about the, the making of company and just kind of, but what I really, yeah, what I loved about Elaine Stritch, actually it sort of goes back to magazines she was really a creature of 20th century old school print media. Like she grew up in suburban Detroit and, and in an era when like families like hers were, were bold faced names in the local society column. So there's this incredible trove of riches about the Stritches before she was Elaine Stritch in New York on Broadway, she was Elaine Stritch of Detroit and her sisters, you know, they were all like whatever bathing suit they were wearing to the country club was was being commented on. Um, so I just I love that stuff. I mean, there was just incredible primary documentation. There were letters, um, you know, there were newspaper clippings and diaries and just all that wonderful stuff uh, that you wouldn't find from late career Madonna. But then also when you write biography, because, you know, we're, we're going to talk about like it in the second part of the show about the uh, cocktails with George and Mar Martha about Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. But when you take on to write biography, is there some sort of, let's say, calling like with Elaine Stritch, like, here is the story about her and I'm going to set it straight. I mean, what like I is mean there? In the case of Elaine Stritch, I really was, even though she was very covered in her life, I was sort of concerned. I mean, first of all, no one had claimed it. No one had, to my great surprise, um, at the time of her death, nobody had sort of been like, I'm writing the Elaine Stritch biography. And I thought that was interesting. It suggested to me a kind of maybe all the people who had been obsessive about her and her entourage toward the end, there was a big documentary about her. Maybe they were slightly exhausted by her. You know, maybe they just, it, it's like that thing that's hiding in plain sight, you know? Right. Um, but I, I felt like her, I, it was, it was mysterious. I mean, I'm, I'm, I felt, I did feel like, uh, it was a, it was a calling. Like it, it felt like, um, not, not so much that there were misconceptions that needed to be set straight, but that I felt like her voice insisted on being heard and that she had contributed something very special to American culture that, should be explained and amplified to the best of my ability. So, you know, that's what I tried to do. And it was tremendous fun doing it. Well, and I think before, uh, it, it's really fantastic. And I, I threw you a book party in uh, oh. February at the beginning of right the pandemic. Right before the pandemic. So it, 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 in February, 2020, because I so love the book and her birthday is I think February 2nd. And we served finger sandwiches because she lived at the Carlisle, et cetera. And then the pandemic hit the next month. And I go, I'm sure we were a COVID spreader at the party. But no, I think this was a pre-super spreader. This it was, was a, a pre -super there were no reported illnesses. And I think it's because the amount of alcohol that was served and consumed anesthetized the group. Which is exactly the point, because I think the connection between the through line. So you just reviewed you know, Philip's book, um, Cocktails with George and Martha. And so for those, Friar McAllister says, Pasadena loves you, Alexandra. So <laughs> I love Pasadena, your, I miss it. So your review of Philip Gepter's book will come in the Sunday New York Times of Cocktails with George and Martha. He's still speaking to you, that's nice. Um, and then you reviewed, <laughs> uh, you did the Elaine Stritch bio. And I think something that when I talk to Philip in the next moment is connects of artists and Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, Elaine Stritch, 
really big artists, really lots of volatile emotion, really, and there, and speaking of alcohol, there was tons of alcohol and Elaine Stritch, like famous, coffee cup full of, what was it during rehearsals? Like whiskey, vodka or something. Like, yeah, like, I mean, at that era, I think it was whiskey. I, I, I don't, and I actually, now I can't remember. I, I think she might've been sober. She played Martha in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in the matinee. And I may be wrong on this memory, but I, I feel like she she had such respect for Albie and the, and the work that that was, might've been one of the few occasions when she actually was just drinking brown water at least. I, no, I think one of the few occasions and I think one time, I think that so many British actors would drink on stage. And, and I, I think some, some one, somebody in her orbit started going out on stage without having ha had like 10 shots of whatever. And they said, what, you're going out there alone? Alone, Which <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but the artistry was like really, really high, but, um. Okay, so in any case, that is the thing that weaves things together of our, our day. So it's like your fantastic, just to cap this off, New York Times book critic, you, your um, your pieces occur all the time and they're always a tremendous read. And I always read them and go, well, I guess I don't need to read the book now because I got, yeah. A, so, a but, friend of mine so jokes that my, my reviews should end, save your money, honey. <laughs> <laughs> like Cindy Adams, you know? But in in the case of cocktails and George and Martha, I with George and Martha, I think yeah. that is actually worth 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 the money. Yes, so fantastic. So thank you, Alexander Jacobs from That's Brooklyn, right. and your biography of Elaine Stritch is still here. Still the here. Nervy At least the paperback version is still here. Of a laser to a really fantastic book. So thank you. Um, thank you. And everyone can look for your review of the Sunday New York Times, another paper besides SENGs. Okay, so thank you so much from Good Brooklyn. Way. Till soon. Yes. Bist like, as they say. Okay. Next up, and that sets us up for our next pre-recorded interview with Philip Gefter. And the book is Cocktails with George and Martha. And the 30 second download of Philip is, Philip Gefter is the author of a, a couple of previous biographies, What Becomes a Legend Most, the biography of Richard Abaddon and Wagstaff before and, ap and after Mapplethorpe, which received the 2014 Marfield Prize for National Arts Writing and a collection of essays, Photography After Frank. He was an editor at the New York Times. We're doing a New York Day for over 15 years. He wrote about photography, was a photography critic for the Daily Beast, contributes frequently to the New Yorker, photo with an aperture, and he produced the award-winning documentary, Bill Cunningham, New York, which is a fantastic documentary. His latest book, just out, is Cocktails with George and Martha, Movies, Marriage, and the Making of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. And here's our interview that we just recorded. Philip, welcome to Bookish. It's so fun to have you on today to talk about cocktails with George and Martha. Thank so, you. Um, it, it, it's a terrific book, and and the topic is something that I hadn't thought about for a while, and immediately started reading about it. And I go, this seems so current. So, but you tell us um, what drew you to tell the story now in twenty twenty four about the making of the movie of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, starring Liz Taylor and Richard Burton. Right. What, what drew you to the story now? Um, well, I think it's a movie about a marriage, but it's also a movie about marriage that is just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Um, also, I mean, I've, I've always loved it. I, it's always been one of my favorite movies. Um, I think it is the movie against which all movies about marriage should be measured, <laughs> at least I've measured them against it, um, for better or worse. And it's not that George and Martha's marriage um, is exemplary by any means, but I think it is um, um, more typical of marriages than not. And it is, it's just, it continues to be relevant to me every time I see the movie. Um, it seems more and more accurate <laughs> um, in terms of kind of addressing a kind of like an x-ray vision of marriage, like under the surface. Um, also, the cast of characters was so compelling. And I'm talking about Edward Albee, who wrote the play, um, Mike Nichols, who directed it, and of course, 
Liz and Dick, the Burtons, who were the most famous couple in the world when the movie was made. So it just seemed ripe for exploration. And also, it was, um, it was the kind of material that occupied my attention, that it, I was interested in enough to sustain two years of research and thinking about, um, you know, it was kind of very ripe. So there you go. And it's an interesting thing to, to, to look back on because Edward Albee was really got fame quite young. Um, you know, in, in his late 20s and 30s, when he wrote this play quite young, Mike Nichols, it's, I believe it's his first picture that he's directing, and he's just 33, which is mind blowing. Yeah. And then Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, who are so famous. I mean, can you just remind or give our viewers uh, just a sense of how scandalous they were? They're America's most famous couple. Can you Paint a picture of what well, they were like you know, at this time. I mean, just just when they when they met and began their affair, they were both married to other people. Um, they were, Elizabeth Taylor was already one of the most famous women in the world, if not at that moment, the most famous. So when they began their affair, it became the scandal that in headlines all around the world, Liz and Dick, Liz and Dick, the scandal, the scandal. Paparazzi followed them for a year. They were they were uh, on the set of Cleopatra, right? The I mean, they're making Cleopatra, Cleopatra. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it was it was so scandalous because you know Elizabeth Taylor was married to um, Eddie Fisher, and and Richard Burton had been married for thirteen years, and they were completely unabashed about their romance. Um, so they became they just became known. They were in headlines all the time. Liz and Dick, Liz and Dick, Liz and Dick. I mean, it's sort of like Taylor Swift today at this moment, you know, but their fame, if if you imagine Taylor Swift now, I mean, she is among arguably the most famous woman in the world right this minute. Um, well, imagine Elizabeth Taylor for more than a year or two years or three years being that famous. Um, so the, it was, you know, the scope of her fame and um, um, her reputation was, you know, beyond comprehension. It was, she was like a household name. Yeah, and it's so, and I think what is so startling and fascinating reading your book, there were many facts that that were, were amazing that by the time she was 32 years old, she made umpteen movies and had been acting for like a couple of decades and that she, and I go, is this right that, and you can see on the cover, the fantastic cover of the book, um, that here she is, and that she is 32 years old making right. this movie. Can you talk a little bit about yes, of course. her I mean, age that was at the time? Huge, it was a huge stretch for a 32-year-old woman who was arguably the most beautiful woman in the world at that moment as well, to play a, a kind of you know slightly unraveling 48-year-old menopausal slightly overweight graying woman and i mean it was a huge leap not only in terms of her ability to do that but also she had you know she had her endless entourage of people her people her manager her, her agents her lawyer um you know people who were concerned about her career because she was it was <laughs> she was so financially viable so they were all very concerned about her next steps at any moment. And this seemed like, you know, it could be a threat to her reputation as the most beautiful woman in the world. And it was, I think, really courageous of her to take that leap and decide, you know, I've made 34 movies, you know, they're all the same. I, you know, I play the same character more or less. And you know, here here is this opportunity to play this really serious uh, character. And you know, Richard Burton read the screenplay first and handed it to her to read, and didn't tell her what he thought of it. And she read it, and she thought, "I I'm not capable of doing this." And Richard Burton said, "Well, I agree, you're not capable, but you have to do it. If you don't do it, you know, somebody else will do it. And just you know, that this is going to be the role of the decade." And so she did. Um, she had to really stretch her abilities to play Martha. I mean, she she had to lower her her voice two octaves consistently because she had a kind of high wispy voice. Um, 
you know, she had to be coaxed by Mike Nichols, and this is where Mike Nichols comes in. He's a first time director, but he had directed several um, award winning plays on Broadway already, and he had a, he he was skilled at that point as as a director, not a film director, but he really worked with her consistently to coax that role out of her. And also, she so she had two mentors. She had Mike Nichols, and she also had her husband Richard Burton, who was you know Shakespearean Broadway like stage actor, who um, who was constantly you know on her to to reach into her her deepest self and pull out this 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 role and she did it it's it's surprising and and i think that one you're you're writing and you've also done an amazing book on richard abaddon the wonderful photographer um of how you break down the technique i mean the technique that they're really serious artists um so philip just reading this book it's so fascinating biographically but also technically of the artistry involved of how people are making this movie and i think the burtons with liz and richard it's amazing that they sort of are leading the life of hollywood stars the dressing rooms full of dom perignon champagne and jewelry and lilies and you know the first read through they be they never began before 10 then there are bloody marys before lunch so it's kind of like a classic the, the old style of, Hollywood life, but they're also really precise and they talk about the work a lot. Yeah. Um, it's, and it's, I think you described Richard Burton also. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that kind of dichotomy and juxtaposition of their extreme wealth and, and also their, their professional rigor at the same time, um, that balance, was was struck in odd ways. I have I have an anecdote um, that that I like to rely on here. Is is when one morning they were they were filming and Elizabeth couldn't find the the Martha voice and she was very frustrated and Mike Nichols was coaxing her and after a while Richard Burton was berating her and she got so frustrated and angry she burst into tears and left the set. So half an hour go by, and, and Richard Burton followed her. So half an hour go by, no Burtons. An hour go by, goes by, no Burtons. They go to lunch, everyone comes back. Another hour goes by, no Burtons. So this is a set of a, a film, you know, the, the, the meter's running. I mean, this is real money, and everyone's just standing around idle. Four o'clock, no Burtons. So a full day is wasted. Finally, at 4.30, they saunter back onto the set, laughing, jovial, with another couple. They introduce Mike to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, with whom they had just had lunch. And <laughs> it sort of put everything in perspective for Mike. He was, he was all ready to berate them for, you know, how dare you waste an entire day? This is like how much untold, like, you know, dollars and thousands of dollars. And, but then, you know, they sort of had their justification. Like they were dining with the Duchess of Windsor, and this is what it was like with the Burdens. At the same time, I say that, but but Elizabeth was really intent on giving a performance, and she was willing to be coaxed, even though she would get frustrated. Um, she was a little more spoiled than other people, but in the end, she really, really worked hard, and she really, I mean, she won an Academy Award for this role. Um, so. Uh, they, and I, I just want to say one other thing, too, about, you know, while my, my book is about the making of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and it starts with Edward Albee and how he conceived the idea for the play. And I mean, that was all very, very high minded and, and serious and earnest. And then it became a phenomenon on, on Broadway and got to Hollywood. There's I, I, I'm equally interested in the art making. I mean, it's it's this book is as much about art making as it is about the subject of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which is marriage, and I go into that quite a bit. But the art making was also serious, and Mike Nichols got to Hollywood, he was a first time director, and he came from New York, and it was like David and Goliath, you know, little small David, Mike Nichols, fighting the studio, fighting Jack Warner, fighting to make sure that the film was in black and white, fighting to make sure that all of Albie's dialogue, you know, that, that the movie cued to Albie's dialogue. Um, 
there were, you know, so many battles he fought for the sake of the film, for the intention of the film. And, um, and I, you know, I was really impressed in my research, you know, consistently, I would see, you know, a level of, of um, quality and integrity um, throughout. I mean, despite Elizabeth, <laughs> despite Elizabeth's excesses and her, um, you know, desire to be given jewelry at every turn um, and, and their three hour lunches and all of that. Um, still, I think that she had, she had um, standards as well, and I think she was aiming for them. Well, and can you talk a little bit about the decision to make it in black and white? Because, you know, color was really popular then. Can you yes, uh, exactly. talk a little bit about what was the choice? Jack, Jack Warner was intent on it being in color because that was all the rage then, and there was new technology for it. But Mike has, I have a quote, I just have to find it. Mike says, here's the thing about black and white. It's not literal. It's a metaphor automatically. And that's the point. A movie is a metaphor. If it's in black and white, the film is already saying, this is not life, this is something about life. And I thought that that was so true. I mean, I think that you know, often he said things that were true <laughs> about, about the nature of things, um, about just the conditions of things. And I think that that's true about black and white. So he wanted it, he, he was intent on it being black and white. So one could say, this is a metaphor. This isn't real. You know, George and Martha aren't you and me necessarily. In fact, they are kind of a version of human nature that we need to kind of explore and investigate um, to understand things about ourselves. And so I think that, I mean, that's kind of a, I just extrapolated from black and white, but I think that that was the intent and that was the reason. And I would say, as we slowly come to a close of this great conversation, I, I think that people will love reading Cocktails with George and Martha because it makes me intrigued. Every 10 pages, you're going to go right back to YouTube and look up a certain scene and start to watch it from the beginning and, and see all the shots and understand what happened and the artistry of Mike Nichols um, and, you know, also, you know, his producer, well, his producer, um, Ernest Lehman, um, who, who also get, gets kind of short shrift in a lot of ways. And but the sound of music, he also has like an amazing background. But even you start looking in on on the movie, because even to putting stuff in the refrigerator that Mike Nichols would pick <laughs> like a half open can of beans and stuff in the refrigerator that only Elizabeth Taylor would see. You never see it on screen. I mean, the, yeah. um, you'll you'll start to watch that, rewatch the movie minutely to see this stuff and how Elizabeth Taylor you, knows to use the camera. You'll just go and watch it many times over. Um, so it is a book about this movie, but also just to end you to go back to the marriage theme. And, and also it's very exciting to read about all the artists working at this time, Andre Previn and Leonard Bernstein. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing period of time where the artistry is really, really high and these conversations are high, are, are of the highest level. You've said, because who's afraid of Virginia Woolf, you said, and this is, gets to be your last word on the subject, it is still the truest rendering of love in marriage that I know. Call me a romantic. Okay, Philip, you have 60 seconds to uh, explain that point. Okay. Why is it the truest? Of because blood. I think in the end, um, George and Martha love each other, despite the fact that they rake each other through the coals throughout an evening, you know, the, it's the, uh, an, an evening of sadism, <laughs> going at each other, destroying each other's character. Um, but you you laugh one minute, it's so witty and hilarious one minute, and you gasp the next. And in the end, they come back together and you realize that, you know, this is kind of like an X-ray version of of marriage. Marriage is a roller coaster emotionally. Um, and they arrive at the end of the evening, you know, that they still love each other and they're willing to make it work another day and try and try to get to the truth. And so I think that that's what the movie's about. I think it's about love. I think it's about the attachment uh, between two people at the core, at the core of, of our, our, our entire emotional construct. And and I'll be 
write, writes about it brilliantly and accurately and perceptively and um, hilariously. Um, so anyway, there you go. That's a short 60, 60 second answer. Um, I could go on. No, it's beautiful. Uh, the first, yeah. it, it starts with the moon and ends with the sun of That's the metaphor. Cool. When light dawns in the morning, you see yeah. their love. It's fantastic. Well, anyway, thank you so much for talking about cocktails with, with George and Martha. It's a fantastic book and it's already getting such a buzz and it's, everyone will read it and go back and see the movie. Thank so you. thanks thank so you much, much. Philip. It, it's a fantastic book. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, uh, that was fantastic. I um, I, I would talk more, but um, I have a meeting with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, um, and I, uh, I I will keep talking as though I I cannot see myself. But I'm going to say thanks to everyone for joining us, Philip and Alexandra and Julie. Uh, tonight, we hope you've enjoyed Bookish. Join us again next month on Bookish. If you'd like to share your thoughts from today, please email us at events at scng.com. Don't have to wait for our next show for great content on authors. Sign up for books editor Eric Peterson's book pages weekly newsletter. Speaking of Eric, here's a message from him on what's coming up in our newspapers. Thanks, everyone. Julie, roll Eric. Hey, thanks, everybody. Uh, coming up this weekend, we've got more from Philip Gefter about his book, Cocktails with George and Martha. I hope that you'll read the interview that we've got. It's also online if you want to check it out now. I believe we had the uh, the link in the chat. Also, we've got a debut author uh, and her book, Medea. Uh, you may know the character. This is a new take on the character uh, and the conversation that we have um, with the author touches on witchcraft and just the changes of uh, how we perceive a powerful woman um, over time. It's a really, really interesting conversation. Check it out. That's also online. And coming up, uh, I've got an interview with um, Kazu Kibushi and, about his book, uh, well, his series, the graphic novel series Amulet, which your kids may know if you don't know yourself. Uh, it's fantastic. He talks about some really compelling things. Uh, it's a really terrific conversation. It's a really terrific uh, series of books. I hope you'll check it out. Also, check out the book pages if you haven't. It's free. It's all about books, and why not? Thanks.